Alright, so the Switch 2 is coming out approximately soon, and you can't have a Nintendo system without a Zelda game. You just can't, preferably early on. A big epic new 3D Zelda game is preferred, but those take approximately the same amount of time to develop as it takes for a new star to be born. And since Tears of the Kingdom only released a year and a half ago, yeah, you can bet it will be old and wrinkly by the time we get a new big open-air 3D release in the Zelda series. Previously, I was hoping that a new 2D Zelda game could take the role of the Switch 2 Zelda title instead in the early days of the system. Sure, maybe it wouldn't be as big an epic or show off the Switch 2's power as much as 3D Zelda would, but 2D Zelda games are still awesome in their own right, and 2D entries can really do a franchise justice when done correctly. However, with Echo's Wisdom having just been released, Chef's Kiss by the way, this game is great, it's safe to say that we've got a good while to wait until we can get another one of those as well. 3D Zelda and 2D Zelda have quite a bit of time until they can be on the forefront again. It was probably for the best that this was a Switch game too, since it retained the art style of the Link's Awakening remake, which, while charming, is definitely not next-gen material. Honestly, even on Switch, it's hard to take the style seriously, and this game's animation is way too minimalist. I thought it worked pretty well for the Link's Awakening remake, but in Echoes of Wisdom's case, I definitely would have preferred something more akin to a modernized version of the Link Between Worlds art style. But that nitpick aside and a few other stuff, uh, Echoes of Wisdom is a really great game. But we do still need a Zelda game of some kind on the next system, and with both the next 2D and 3D games looking like they won't be ready until sometime down the road, I suppose the best hope we have for a big awesome next-gen Zelda game in the general vicinity of the next system's launch would be if they had some studio other than Nintendo EBD or Grezzo give us a remake of an older big and awesome Zelda game that pushes it up to next-gen standards. And of the options available of games to remake, the best choice is absolutely positively The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. This game was legendary. It's the highest rated game ever on Metacritic, out of any game on Metacritic, Ocarina of Time is the highest. And at the time of its release, it easily dwarfed any other game on the market in terms of scope and exploration. All the great high fantasy action adventure medieval combat games we have today, like Skyrim and Elden Ring and of course Breath of the Wild, started here with this game. But nowadays, it has not aged great. People who grew up with this game, or games like it, usually won't have a problem, but a spoiled modern gamer like me? Please. It did get a remake on the 3DS that added a few quality of life improvements and updated the visuals so they were more than just shapes, but even that isn't free from the jank of the original. Plus, the 3DS only has one circle pad, so have fun with camera control! This is the version I played on when I first went through the game around 9-ish months ago, and even it aged poorly in my opinion. But the core of this game is still absolutely fantastic. So if this game got a complete ground up remake that modernizes all of its great ideas, removes any and all jank, fixes any design issues, and makes the game a perfect fit for current audiences, then that would be great. A game that's just as incredible now for a modern player as it was for N64 owners back in 1998. Except for the fact that back then there were basically no other games like Ocarina of Time, and nowadays the fantasy adventure genre is huge, so it's not exactly like it's the inconceivable game now than it was back then, even if it did get a huge awesome remake, but it'll be the best game that it can possibly can be. But what would be the best way to go about doing this? Well, I'd be happy to give you all my take on it. Now, before we can get to some of the fun stuff, we need to go over the basic necessities of a remake. Visuals are the first thing that any remake does, unless you want to be like Skyward Sword and do jack shit outside of a simple upscaling, but we will not be doing that. We need to show off the awesome, powerful hardware of the Nintendo Switch 2. Of course, the 3DS remake already did a lot of uplifting with the graphics, but the 3DS is barely stronger than the GameCube. And this is a Switch 2 game, so it would only make sense to make this the most graphically extensive Zelda game ever. So just take Ocarina of Time on the 3DS and go full Metroid Prime Remastered on it in terms of visual upgrades. You know those fan-made Ocarina of Time demos made in Unreal Engine? 
that. Ocarina of Time on the Switch 2 should look like that. When bringing a game to a modern system, the most important part of remaking it is the controls. Even if you're just making a bare-bones port, if the original game's control scheme doesn't work with the new hardware, you've gotta update that. As we all know, the N64 controller was an absolute mess. Thankfully, the 3DS control scheme is a lot closer to what we have now, but it's still pretty rough around the edges, and considering the lack of a touchscreen on the Switch, and most likely the Switch 2 as well, we'll need to revamp a bit of this for sure. For one, now that we have a right stick, we'll finally get to use the almighty camera control. Huzzah! At long last! Then, since the touchscreen is gone, you'll have to press the plus button to open your inventory and the minus button to open your map. One important thing to note about the map, it will no longer just display this cool artwork of Hyrule as your game's map. Instead, we'll get an exact detailed loadout of the game's world that shows the exact position of both you and your next objectives in the main quest, like in modern Zelda games. This game will also use the cool 3D rotating inventory screen in the N64 version, rather than the boring bottom screen inventory on the 3DS. In terms of some other controller changes, ZR is now automatically tied to your bow, or your slingshot depending on what you have, instead of the bow just being toggled with X or Y like all the other items in the game. I'll also be moving Link's roll move from being one of the many functions of the A button to being tied to ZL although all the other A button functions will remain the same. This is because I'll be making the A button Link's new official jump button. Because the whole auto jump thing was pretty clunky in the original Ocarina of Time. The Ocarina will be used by pressing down on the D-pad, and talking to Navi is done by pressing up on the D-pad. Although sometimes when Navi is trying to say something minor quickly, her text will just automatically display on screen in small letters without pulling you out of the game. In terms of how Link will feel to control in this game, Link will complete actions much more quickly and smoothly than he did in the original, in order to make this game feel more responsive. During parts of combat where Link gets stuck or knocked to the ground, he'll get up much faster in order to keep Link under the player's control as much as possible. You want him to feel very responsive in this game. And that's it for the basics, now for the fun stuff. Here's my changes to the world of Hyrule. Alright, now here's the real stuff. I wasn't lying when I said that we'd be modernizing this game, because we are. Compared to Breath of the Wild, Ocarina of Time's map feels somewhat confined and empty. Now, this is to be expected when comparing any N64 game to Breath of the Freaking Wild. But even when compared to earlier games like Twilight Princess, Wind Waker, and even Majora's Mask, which came out less than two years later than Ocarina of Time, Ocarina of Time's world map outside of dungeons really felt quite limited. So, let's fix that here and now. What we're going to do here is quite simple. Take the world of Ocarina of Time and double it in size. Just double the whole thing. Dungeons, confined buildings, and some other specific tightly designed sequences can say the same, but Hyrule Field, Lake Hylia, Death Mountain, Castle Town, Gerudo Desert, Kafrika Village, all of it gets cranked up to twice the size. There doesn't need to be any brand new regions to fill in the gaps, the borders of the world can remain in the same spot, but the whole map at large will be increased. Some more confined locations like Lost Woods and Goron City don't need to have a size increase quite as extreme as Times 2, but they'll still be a lot bigger than they were originally. This game's world just needs to be big. Kokiri Forest should have parts that feels like a proper, unconfined forest. Climbing Death Mountain should feel like climbing a full-scale mountain. Lake Hylia should be a vast lake with a large coastline. Gerudo Desert should be as dry and expansive as the desert should be. Kakarika Village and Castle Town should be less centralized and more like the size of an actual town. And even the path leading up to Zora's Domain should be a less of a confined canyon space. And it should be more like, you know, actual running up the river. Make this game as grand now as it seemed for gamers who played this game as a kid for the first time back in 1998. Give it the same feeling of scope that the original ones seemed to have. Along with the larger world, loading zones will be cut out in many places. Entrances to buildings or confined locations like Goron City and Zora's Domain can remain in order to keep designing things simple, but it'd be very good for immersion if the overworld, at least, remained consistent. So Lake Hylia, Death Mountain, the Path to Zora's Domain, Kokiri Forest, 
Hyrule Castle, and Castle Town, and probably Gerudo Desert, will all remain in the same scene as Hyrule Field without needing to load between them. Tears of the Kingdom could show all this without any loading screens, so for the technically superior Nintendo Switch 2, I think being able to give us Ocarina of Time's overworld with no loading screens should be a piece of cake. But what point is there in having such a large world if there's nothing to do in it? Even in the original Hyrule Field on Ocarina of Time, it was practically empty. There is nothing to do out here except ride around on Epona and occasionally fight skeletons at nighttime while you're childling. Lame. So let's fill up this place with stuff to do. Obviously, there's Lon Lon Ranch, which is now just straight up a part of Hyrule Field instead of being encased in stone cliffs and put behind its own loading zone. Here, Lon Lon Ranch is just a part of Hyrule Field's normal map, but we'll need more than that. So we'll put a monster base here, a cave where a ravenous beast lives there, another cave with a puzzle that unlocks some treasure here. Other parts of the game, like the size-increased Kakariko Village and a graveyard, would also have more stuff crammed in, like more NPCs and side quests and businesses. Of course, to fill up this influx of content that wasn't in the original, there'd have to be plenty of rewards too, and the player would likely get a lot more rupees than they would in the original. And Link's starting wallet size would be a lot larger so that you can actually use these rupees instead of just having them cap out and then you get them and then they can't do anything. In order to counter the larger amount of rupees you'd get in this game, prices in shops would be inflated compared to in the original title. Hyrule's economy is volatile, man. Additionally, as rewards for exploring and solving new puzzles, this game's total number of parts would go from 20 to 24, meaning there are now 16 whole new pieces of heart to be uncovered in this game's world. Good luck finding them! Now, I know what you're thinking. Calvin, with both the more refined control scheme and the greater total number of hearts, won't this game become much easier than the original? But don't worry, I plan on balancing that out once we get to combat and enemies. First of all though, it is now design time. Now, when it comes to other adventure games with larger worlds, like Metroid or Pokemon, you start in your own small corner of the map and slowly fill out the whole thing as you go on. But in most Zelda games, Ocarina of Time included, you start out very centralized, with the largest parts of the map already unlocked, and you just have a bunch of small areas off at the sides of the map that you need to go to sequentially. When games that are designed like this have an intended sequence, it feels a lot more forced when you have to unlock and complete these areas one by one. Which is why it made so much sense for the recent Zelda games to allow you to do the different sets of the dungeons in any order that you wanted. Although it definitely worked better for progression when it allowed you to have that within reason, instead of just letting you do any dungeon, even the final one, whenever you want, like in Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. It definitely worked better in A Link Between Worlds and Echoes of Wisdom, when you unlock a set of dungeons at once, and you can complete all the dungeons within that set in any order that you wanted, before you then unlock the next set of dungeons, which you then completed in any order you wanted after completing the whole first set. After looking at how Ocarina of Time did its progression between regions originally, I feel like I can confidently say that there aren't many downsides to adding this style of progression into the game. With how Ocarina of Time handles regions and dungeons and MacGuffins and even its story, it feels quite arbitrary to have to do one region before the other. Like I said, this isn't like Pokemon Gyms or like the whole Metroidvania format where you start small and then sort of just like move forward and unlock most of the world as you go on. Most of the world is already unlocked in this game, it's just like the smaller regions off to the side. Getting the freedom to do dungeons in different orders just makes sense in Ocarina of Time. I feel like the game was already designed around it, but then it just didn't have it. Now of course, this wouldn't be full Breath of the Wild level of freedom. It would still be definitely quite confined compared to that game. You would of course do the Deku Tree and meet Princess Zelda first, then you'd be assigned to grab the Goron Ruby from Death Mountain and the Zora Sapphire from Zora's Domain, and this could be done in either order. Any roadblocks preventing you from doing Zora's Domain first in the original would either be removed or you'd be given an alternate solution for it. Then after that you do the whole Ganondorf chasing Princess Zelda event, and get both the Ocarina of Time and the Master Sword, and then get stuck in the Sacred Realm for 7 years. 
After you get out of the Sacred Realm, you will have to do the Forest Temple first for a few reasons. Like, keeping things simple at the start of the Adult Era, the story details given in this part, scaling the difficulty down for the first Adult Region before giving the player total freedom, and letting the player unlock the ability to become a child again afterwards, before they fully set out, because that only unlocks after you do the Forest Temple in the original. After you do the Forest Temple though, you'll get the freedom to do any of the other four adult dungeons in any order. I considered making it so that you'd still be required to do the Spirit Temple last, but I decided against it since I figured it'd be best not to restrict the player's freedom so close to the end, and because that it would leave it with there only being three dungeons left in the unrestricted sequence, which isn't a great idea with the remaining temples all being so close together. Shadow Temple and Fire Temple especially. So instead, you'll be able to do the Fire Temple, Water Temple, Shadow Temple, and Spirit Temple in any order. Since Kakariko Village and the Graveyard are both much bigger in this version of the game, the Evil Well will be decently far away from the entrance to Death Mountain, so trying to go to the Fire Temple won't necessarily overlap with the Shadow Temple cutscene stuff, or vice versa. Although the Well Monster cutscene will still only trigger after clearing the Forest Temple. Now, most of these areas did originally require items from previous dungeons in order to properly progress through them. For instance, getting through Gerudo Desert requires both the Hover Boots to walk on quicksand and the Eye of Truth to see the path through the sandstorm. Some of these item requirements here will just be waived, like you won't need the Eye of Truth to follow the ghost through the storm anymore, for example. While items from one region will never be required to progress into another region, they should still be useful in other regions, whether by making things a little bit easier, or by providing access to optional secrets which you wouldn't otherwise be able to obtain. And of course, as you get later into the game, the enemy AI will automatically become tougher no matter what dungeon you're on. This would change the game's design a bit, but we're already massively scaling up the size of the game, so I don't think it would be a huge deal. Once again, with the way Ocarina of Time's world is laid out, with you getting access to the bulk of the map from the start and visiting a lot of regions twice, I feel like it was made for letting you do the regions in any order, rather than forcing an intended sequence on you. I feel like that just makes more sense for this game specifically. And uh, honestly, that goes for a lot of other Zelda games too. Frankly, I'm surprised it took as long as it did for them to finally let us do things in different orders. Zelda feels like it was made for that formula just in general. But now for other design changes, specifically on the accessibility side of things. Because back in the N64 days, before game design philosophy had been quite as refined as it is nowadays, games had a tendency to be cryptic and not very friendly for newcomers who didn't have a boatload of time on their hands to throw everything at the wall. Now, I got stuck a lot in Ocarina of Time, and I'm sure the majority of other people did too. But for me, it wasn't because of puzzle difficulty, since most of the puzzles are somewhat simple, Usually, when I got stuck, it was about a lack of clarity and conveyance for the game's mechanics. Now, getting stuck on a puzzle is never a pleasant experience, but I'd much rather be stuck on a difficult and complex puzzle because it's difficult and complex, rather than a really, really simple puzzle that takes a long time to complete, not because it's mentally challenging, but instead because it has an unclear and obscure solution that you shouldn't reasonably expect your players to think up of. A lot of these solutions seemed obvious in hindsight, but for a first time player, they had no way to know. Take this room at the very start of the game in the Great Decker Tree, for example. What I needed to do was shoot this eye and unlock this door, but since I had just started playing and didn't really have a grasp on the mechanics yet, I didn't realize that. As a matter of fact, I didn't even notice that this eye was here the first few times I entered this room. It took me quite a while before I figured it out, and though I can't quite remember, I might have had to use a guide. It's very early in the game, you can't expect players to understand this stuff immediately. I've heard similar stories with people in the Deku Tree dungeon not knowing that they can use Deku sticks to carry fire and light torches to open doors. I'd like to say this eases up after you learn the mechanics of the game when you get a lot later down the line when it's a lot of the later dungeons. And while it kinda does clear things up a little eventually, things are still pretty confusing for a large portion of the game. In Goron City, I hear that Big Brother Darunia is holed up in his room waiting for the royal family messenger because their food supply is out due to Ganondorf sabotage. To get to him, you have to play Zelda's lullaby so he opens his doors for you before realizing that you're not the messenger, you're just a kid. So now the way you have to get through to him is... Use Saria's song to get rid of his depression? What? He's pissed because his people are starving, 
He wants to talk to the royal family. Why is mood improvement a part of the equation? This sequence is hard to get through, not because it's a challenging puzzle, but because the solution is just weird. So this remake should absolutely try to fix this if it wants this game to be accessible to modern audiences. Make the simple yet obscure solutions to quote unquote puzzles a lot more obvious so that players can put more of their focus into the actual puzzle part of this game's puzzles instead of just getting stuck at the start of the game and barely getting anywhere. So that brings me to my broader solution to most of these issues, Navi. Earlier, I said that Navi would sometimes automatically make minor comments to you that wouldn't pull you out of the gameplay, instead just displaying the text at the bottom of the screen while the game keeps going. One of the things that Navi would do with this is give the player hints in situations like these. Not in real big major puzzles, the player is on their own in that situation, but during basic quote-unquote puzzles that are only difficult because the player doesn't know the mechanics behind the intended solution, or when the solution simply requires Link to use a tool that the player had no reason to think was relevant in this scenario, Navi will let Link know what he can do at the bottom of the screen. Hey Link, you should try using the Deku sticks to carry that fire. Hey Link, that web might break apart if you jump on it from a high enough place. Hey Link, I think you might be able to use a bottle to capture some of that blue fire. Okay, maybe a little less on the nose than that. We do still want to let the players have an aha moment when they figure it out, but since Ocarina of Time tends to be extremely situational with how complicated its mechanics are depending on whether or not it actually wants to use them for this one specific thing, I think it'd be far better for new players if these mechanics were spelled out. Again, Navi wouldn't help at all during real puzzles, she'd just make it clear to you when you don't know the mechanics involved behind the solution. Now to be fair, they do kind of try to have Navi do this in the original sometimes, but she doesn't do it often enough, and a lot of the time she's being too vague. Really pushing in this game, we don't want players to get stuck and drop this game after spending 60 whole dollars on it. Now to make up for Navi making all these quote unquote puzzles way easier to figure out, it would be a good idea to try and possibly add in some new puzzles to some of this game's dungeons. Ones that weren't in the original and are a good bit intellectually challenging. Not that many new puzzles, maybe just like one per dungeon and possibly not even for all dungeons. But the new puzzle content might be a good way to keep some of the longtime fans at bay, since they might not be happy about these other quote-unquote puzzles being explained to the player, even though they already know it anyway, and it's mainly just to benefit the people who haven't played the game before. Another issue is more overworld sequences, where the place you need to go to to progress forward is on a completely different part of the map, and you have to do something pretty elaborate, but the game doesn't really explain that to you, so you're just confused. An example of this is getting a Pona, it's both an essential tool for traversing around Hyrule Field through a lot of the adult era, and you need it near the end to get into Gerudo Desert, but the whole sequence of events you need to do to get a Pona is really elaborate, and it feels like a side quest, but if you don't get a Pona, then you're screwed. Despite the fact that it's really unclear what you need to do to get a Pona. Another issue is the bottom of the well. They tell you about that a bunch in Kakariga Village, but my first playthrough, I didn't know that I had to go to the child timeline to get into that. This is an issue that is helped a bit with the Sheikah Stones, but I feel like the Ocarina of Time version on the Switch 2 should sort of mediate that a little. It should make it more obvious where you need to go. It should make the Epona quest especially much more obvious. Because getting stuck in the overworld because you don't know what to do or where to go, that just sort of sucks. It's not mentally challenging, it just sucks. There's also another thing I think Ocarina of Time needs for better accessibility, and that is checkpoints. Having to run back and forth through the whole damn dungeon every time you die simply isn't fun. It punishes the player's failure by wasting their time to a far greater degree than they deserve. Some of these dungeons do have a checkpoint of some sort, but not all of them do, and it's usually a while until you unlock these checkpoints. So just make a few more checkpoints per dungeon. They definitely shouldn't riddle the entire temple with them. You should still need to go back through a good bit of the dungeon as a punishment for dying. But when there's any areas that are particularly far from the start, they should get checkpoints. Don't take a player's low skill level as an excuse to take away their fun, because that's just mean. And that's it for design. Although I suppose there is one thing that's pretty important. For the love of God, please make the water temple easier. Now for the last thing I must address, combat. 
Now, I actually really like the combat of the original Ocarina of Time. It's fun, and it's engaging, but it's also quite clear it's from an N64 game. All the enemies are quite basic, most of them can't really do much outside of one, maybe two, simple attacks, and one or two movement options. I said earlier that I would be making up for how the extra heart pieces and smoother controls make things easier, and this is how. Almost every single enemy will get at least one new type of attack, and usually new movements, alongside the attack methods that they already had from the start. Not to mention, there will also be a slew of new enemies, particularly those who inhabit the larger area of Hyrule Field, now that the map has doubled in size. I'd said there'd be like a big monster den with a ravenous beast inside, and there'd be like a monster base somewhere. Then bosses will have their capabilities expanded even more. Ocarina of Time's bosses are fine, they work fine, they're very iconic, I do quite like them, but compared to modern bosses, they feel really simple. In Ocarina of Time, there is nowhere else where the limitations of the N64 are more obvious in the boss design than in the first phase of the Ganondorf fight. It's just a game of tennis, you barely actually fight him, this kinda sucks frankly. So all of this game's bosses will be added upon. They'll keep all of their current moves and mechanics, but they'll also be given several new moves and abilities that they didn't have previously. That is, except for the Ganondorf fight, which will be entirely 100% revamped with many proper sword and magic casting elements in mind, rather than just being a Dead Man's Volley. We can keep the Dead Man's Volley with Phantom Ganon, but a regular Ganondorf's fight needs to be more unique. Oh, and for any bosses who require a certain amount of a certain resource, and if you run out of that resource you're screwed, get rid of that. Either provide a way to obtain more of that resource indefinitely, or remove the requirement for it entirely. Now, okay, I'm not going to change this game's story much. Ocarina of Time's story is definitely one of the better Zelda stories, for sure. It does throw a lot of exposition at you, so maybe make some of the story things involve a little bit more than just explanatory dialogue. You know, maybe get a little bit more in there with some stuff. I also think Ganondorf is far too blatantly pure evil in this game. His portrayal in Ocarina is even more blatantly evil than it was in Tears of the Kingdom. And that's saying a lot considering how much his character was criticized in Tears of the Kingdom for having no motivation aside from just being evil. But it's even worse in Ocarina of Time, as everyone in this game quite literally refers to him as the Evil King. And that's not only for them to criticize him behind his back or anything, no, King of Evil is Ganondorf's official title in this game. He refers to himself as Evil King with pride as if being evil was a positive trait to this man. Just dial it back a bit, that's all I ask. You don't need to give him sympathetic motivations or anything, just don't make it so obvious that he was written with the sole purpose of being Mr. Bad Guy who is bad, and has no character outside of that. I know this is a remake we're talking about here, so there's only really so much that they can do to edit Ganondorf to make him less... <laughs> and nothing else. But even just a few dialogue changes would mean all the difference. Oh, and also, voice acting, please. Ocarina of Time with voice acting. It's all I ask. Bring back Matt Mercer for Ganondorf, please. And that is how I believe Ocarina of Time should be remade. I know it differs a lot from the original, and it might piss off purists who just want the same game but with updated controls and visuals. But every change I made was made for a reason. These issues with the mechanics behind puzzles being unclear and cryptic is a huge barrier to entry for a lot of players, and I want to ensure that as many people can enjoy this legendary game as possible without being prevented by stupid and simple obstacles with unclear answers. It probably don't seem like much if you first played this game years ago and have been replaying it in the years since, but trust me, if you go watch someone do a blind playthrough of Ocarina of Time, you'll see that they'll often get stuck in a lot of places that aren't fun to get stuck in. We already got a faithful 3DS remaster, so I think it's time for something that truly lets this game live up to modern gaming standards and the freedom given by modern Zelda, while also still following the design philosophies of classic Zelda and having the old standard dungeons and item-based progression. What better way to marry the styles of old and new Zelda than to take an old Zelda game and make it new? I really hope you all enjoyed this video. 
If you did, maybe check out this other video where I come up with an idea for a brand new 2D Zelda game. It was made before Echoes of Wisdom was revealed, mind you. Or this other video where I come up with an alternative idea for what could have been the next 2D Metroid game instead of Dread.